John 8, 32, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. My name is Eddie Brady, and this is my story of why I left the Pentecostal holiness faith. Let me start by saying that I grew up in a small town in North Carolina with about only 400 people in that, in that area. In that small town, there was a Methodist church, a Baptist church, and a Pentecostal holiness church. We attended, my family and I, the Methodist congregation most of the time. My mom was a Sunday school teacher. However, we were not faithful at all, uh, all the time. We would go maybe six months or three months and miss here and there. But any time that there was a vacation Bible school or Easter Sunday, we were always there or special events. But then there was times that mom would be consistent in, in bringing us and she would teach the Bible, the kids at Bible class. But there was three congregations there, and each summer, they, the Methodist, the Baptist, and the Pentecostal would each hold a vacation Bible school. And anytime they held a vacation Bible school, no matter which congregation you attended, you always attended their vacation Bible school. And every Easter Sunday, these three congregations, the Methodist, Baptist, and Pentecostal, they would coordinate with one another to get together at the local uh, cemetery and have a sunrise service, and each congregation uh, would change each year who was in control, and they would have a breakfast after. So all three congregations, they were kind of on the corner. Um, you could kind of see the Baptist from the Methodist and the Pentecostal from the Baptist, and they all worked together and all um, got along really, really well. So they were the only three con congregations that I really grew up around in my time there in North Carolina. I graduated high school in 1993. My mind was not on God at all. I didn't attend or have a desire to attend at all. I've always believed in God, but He wasn't a priority in my life at that time. But I was always taught to believe in God. But I just never really followed Him. In 1999, I met this young lady, not my wife, where I worked in. Her dad was a Pentecostal holiness preacher. I decided one Sunday to go with her, not because of God, but because of the girl. I wanted to impress her and, and come and be with her at services. They had a huge band, lots of entertainment, and I really, really enjoyed it. But at the end of the sermon, the preacher had everyone close their eyes. He said, if you felt that you were lost and needed Jesus to please raise your hand, well, with the bands and the, the sermon and the emotions going through me, I raised my hand. I don't remember what the sermon was about, but I just knew there was certain emotion there that led me to, to raise my hand. Then the preacher said, for all those that raised their hand to please come forward. So I did, and there was probably about 10 to 15 of us. They had said a prayer. They said, you need to say a prayer, and you need to ask Jesus into your heart. Well, they took us in the back to meet with the leaders of the congregation, and they were men and women back there, and we sat there and we met with them. And over the next couple of weeks, several from that congregation came to my home and talked to me and gave me different study material. Well, at that time, I asked them about which scripture that they use about asking Jesus into your heart, and they would go to Romans 10, 9 and 10, and we'll talk more about that as we go through this. But they didn't give me a whole lot of scripture. They talked a lot about emotions and so I kept attending for several months, and then I moved to South Carolina with a girl and her family. But after a few months, we broke up, and I came back home. At this point, I started attending the Pentecostal congregation in my hometown that I had mentioned earlier, and I became very involved. I became interested in preaching and teaching, and the local preacher there introduced me to the superintendent of the Pentecostal Holiness Conference in North Carolina, which was in Falcon, North Carolina, and I began their school, and I went through four years of their school and completed all of their studies. It's a lot different, though, from the Lord's Church preaching schools. 
I'm actually a graduate, and I'll talk about that more later, of Tri-City School of Preaching in Elizabethan, Tennessee. And the school that I went to, the Pentecostal, is completely different. Some classes were on site, but most of the material was take home and do self-study and return the test via mail. Most of the material was commentaries. 90, probably 80, 98, 99% were commentaries. I preached all over the place and was really enjoying it. And I thought I would be doing that for the rest of my life. It's something that I enjoyed and I love being in a Pentecostal holiness. I also was working full time at Sprint in Tarbon, North Carolina. Renetta, now my wife, worked in the same office as me. We sat side by side for 18 months. But at this point in my life, I was still at, at Sprint except in another department across the hall. I was a minister at a Baptist congregation while the Pentecostal preacher. Let me explain this. A good friend of mine in the Pentecostal holiness was also a preacher. And the job that he had in this town, Tarbon, North Carolina, he worked with a lot of people that attended a Baptist congregation and they were looking for a preacher. And they worked with the Baptist missionary organization, but they were unable to find one. So they asked this gentleman to come and preach. And he did for a while. And then he got a full-time preaching position in a Pentecostal holiness congregation. So he asked me to come. So for four months, I was still Pentecostal holiness, but I was the full-time preacher at a missionary Baptist congregation. And in hopes the Pentecostal sent me there, in hopes that I would convert them to be a Pentecostal holiness congregation. I will say that during my time there, they were wonderful to me. They treated me very, very well. And after four months, it was really hard to leave them. But they found a full-time preacher, and I went back to the Pentecostal. Now, I consider myself uh, to be a very diligent Bible student. I thought I was a Christian. I tried living according to the Word of God to the best of my ability. I didn't drink. I didn't smoke. I wasn't involved in sexual morality. I truly loved God, but didn't realize that I was living in error. But the more I preached, the more I studied, because I love God, and it meant, it meant a lot to me to be sure that when I stood before a congregation that I was speaking the truth. The more I studied, the more I started to see things a little different than what the Pentecostal holiness was teaching me. Now, they did believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit was one. They taught faith only, but also said you must say the sinner's prayer to be saved. So there was a lot of confusion there of what was right and what was wrong. The verses, Romans 10, 9, and 10, were some of the main verses they used for the people getting saved. And we want to turn to these verses in Romans 10, 9, and 10 now. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now these are the verses that they would use to say that this is how you become a child of God. All you had to do was confess with your mouth. Now we know that we must confess. We understand that. We must. But these are the only verses that they would use in verse 10. For with the heart one believes unto righteous, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. I believe that's all you had to do was to confess and believe. One of the main reasons I believe this is what I was told. And let me stop there for just a moment. A lot of what I believed throughout the Pentecostal in my days was following what a preacher or a superintendent of the conference or someone told me. I didn't study and research the scriptures as I should have. So the more I begin to study, the more questions I begin to have. We are to study God's word. And I thought I was, but I wasn't. Of course, when I read and really studied Mark 16, 15, 16, this is where the question started to really arise. And if you go to Mark 16, 15, 16, the Bible reads, And he said to them, Go into all the world 
and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. My questions really started here because of verse 16. He who believes, I understood that we must believe. I got that from Romans 10, 9, and 10. But then the question began is, what about and is baptized will be saved? So I really started to have a lot of questions at this point. So if the entire Bible is the inspired Word of God, then why don't we have to be baptized to be saved? The answer I was given was because Jesus meant in this scripture that being baptized, by being baptized, you were just showing a different commitment to Him. That's the answer that I got continuously. I was told that baptism was not for salvation at all. In the Pentecostal wholeness, we would have what we call baptism services. They were usually held after Sunday morning message in a fellowship meal. I was baptized, I thought, six to eight times. Basically, I just got wet. We would have many people have a service come up and say they sent us prayer, which we cannot find anywhere in God's Word, but they would say what the preacher would say, sinner's prayer, and then we would schedule a baptism service. So when I started asking questions, they would become extremely upset with me that I would question their teaching. Also, they believed in speaking in tongues. Now, I was very faithful to that denomination, but could never speak in tongues. I always wondered why, and I was just was told by other Pentecostal members that my faith wasn't strong enough. Later, through study, I realized why, and that speaking in tongues is ceased. They never talked to me about 1 Corinthians 12 or 13. It was always emotions. Always emotions. What was strange was that in Acts 2.38, when Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I ask about remission because I looked it up. They would just say that this is where we're told of receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit by baptism wasn't for salvation. This really, really confused me because you look at the verses in Acts 2.38 again, let repent and let everyone be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, which means forgiveness. So the questions just continue to grow and grow. 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 13. Love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part. But then I shall know just as I also am known. And now abide in faith, hope, love. These three things, but the greatest of these is love. These verses were never taught to me about the tongues and they will seize and in the Old Testament and the New Testament, they, they preached from both of them. They were just a few questions that I had. The problem was every time I would try and find answers, I was just met with hostility and just told that I didn't need to question the Pentecostal preacher or superintendent. In October of 2002, I preached at my hometown in Pentecostal Holiness Congregation. And while I was preparing the lesson, I was so discouraged. Nothing was making sense. So after I preached that morning, the following day I called the superintendent in Falcon, North Carolina of the Pentecostal Holiness Conference. And I told him I was taking a break for a while. And he became very upset with me. Later that month, I was walking down the hall. Renetta, now my wife, we were not dating at the time, but she was heading my way going to lunch. And she asked if I would like to go with her to Subway, and I said yes. We were both single, and we had a lot in common. We went to Subway, took our sandwiches to the park, and we ate. It was a great conversation. I shared with her what I was dealing with in the Pentecostal holiness. And she listened very well and then invited me to come 
to a service at the Church of Christ with her. Later, I found out that our boss, the one that both hired us, because we worked side by side for a while, was a fallen away member of the church, had been discussing me with her. He kept insisting that I would be a great preacher for the church of Christ, and she kept reminding him that I was holding his preacher and that he was nuts. They had no idea I had, what I had been wrestling with. And it's a great lesson for us all in not prejudging anyone or underestimating the power of the gospel. Renetta was worshiping at a congregation in Rocky Mount, North Carolina. I went with her that Sunday morning. It just so happened to be their first service in the building. The minister, Jack, now, he's, he's gone on to his reward, but he preached a sermon about being a new, cre a new creation and being baptized. He hammered home baptism. He preached the truth, but at that time, I was just mad because he was preaching against, uh, against all that I believed in. I left with more questions than answers. I still had a desire to stay with Pentecostal holiness, so I decided I would get to the bottom of this. There was a gentleman at the time in the Pentecostal holiness had been there for 56 years, and some considered him to be able to walk on water, not literally, but considered him to be a walking Bible. He seemed to have all the answers so I asked Renetta, would she study with him? And surprisingly, to my surprise, she said, of course. At this point, I realized that I needed to have her and this gentleman meet. And when they met, this gentleman came to the Bible study without a Bible. Renetta came with a Bible, and she was very kind, and she talked to him. And after that conversation, I realized that I needed to resign from the Pentecostal Holiness Conference. So I met with the local preacher in my hometown congregation, advised him my decision, and he said I was just letting lust get in the way of my walk with Christ because Renette and I now were starting to get closer. The next day, I informed the superintendent, and he removed me from the conference. So I met with the local preacher, and... He just continued, continued to talk about lust. So I started dating Renetta in November 2002. I still had so many questions, still attended Pentecostal Holiness occasionally, and I went with Renetta to Church of Christ some. I was just really, really confused. Now, Malachi 3, 8 through 10, I want to talk about this for a moment. So it was around Christmas time in 2002. My mom had been diagnosed with cancer. She is doing great, still with us today, 20 years later. But we were all there and at, her, at the house, and I was putting up Christmas lights. And Renette and I were out on the porch and the sidewalk, and we were untangling these lights, and we were talking about the Pentecostal. And when you are a Pentecostal preacher in the conference, you have to agree to give 18% every paycheck to the conference. And they actually take it out of your check, and it's direct deposited into the conference. And I was talking about that, and she asked me about the why in the scriptures, and I share with her Malachi 3, 8 through 10. Well, the man robbed God, yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offering. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Renetta looked at me and said, Eddie, that is the old law. We are no longer under that law. Do you sacrifice animals? And I was like, what? I was shocked with what she said. Now, I knew there was an Old and a New Testament, obviously, but she had just what she had just said blew me away. She said, according to Colossians 2.14, the old law was nailed to the cross. Colossians 2.14, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, nailing it, nailed it to the cross. She said, we're no longer under the law, and that was for our learning. She brought in Romans 15, 4. 
For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures may have hope. She said, if you bring one thing over, Eddie, you must bring it all. I was so confused at all, and I didn't know what, what I was being told. I didn't know what was going on, and she was providing those book, chapter, and verses. She introduced me to a Church of Christ preacher, Mike Hendricks, a wonderful, humble man and a great gospel preacher. In December, I asked Renetta to marry me of 2002, and she said yes. Now, at this point, I wasn't a Christian thought I was, but she knew I wasn't. I later asked why she agreed to marry me if I wasn't a Christian, and she said she knew that God would work it out, but she also said that if things didn't work out, she wasn't going to marry me, and I didn't know that. But that says a lot about who she is and her love for God. So in February 2003, we were at Georgetown, South Carolina to visit her mom and dad. And on that Sunday the 16th, we were scheduled to meet with the minister of Georgetown Church of Christ, Fred, to discuss our wedding. That Sunday, Fred preached a very basic and wonderful message. And no, I didn't respond. But during the meeting at Bible Hour, when he met with us, he said, Now, Renetta, you're a Christian. And I said, And so am I. And he and Renetta looked at each other and smiled. And it really bothered me. And I, I really didn't understand what they were saying until he preached this message. And then I got it. He preached the plan of salvation according to God. To hear, believe, repent, confess, and put on Christ through baptism and live faithfully. So Renette and I ate lunch with our parents and we went to Big Lots before heading back to North Carolina. And I looked at her in there and I said, Renetta, based on what Brother Fred talked this morning, based on the scriptures and where I currently am, in my spiritual walk, if I don't follow those things and put on Christ, then I'm going to go to hell. And without a hesitation, she said yes. So her parents lived about 30 minutes away. We called him, met Fred back at the building, and I've put on Christ. I, that was the best decision that I ever made. And it was because that I had somebody willing to study with me Someone willing to take time and cared for my soul, but someone willing to use the scriptures and not opinion. In April of 2011, when we had been worshiping at North Charleston, South Carolina Church of Christ for just over a year, we lived there where her mom and dad lived. I heard a lesson that pierced my heart on a Sunday night. I worked at Lowe's at that moment, and I got off that Sunday night around 5 o'clock, and service started at 6. I was tired. I had been working 8, 9 hours. And I didn't get the chance to go to service that morning, and I wanted to go home that night. But I knew if I went home, and this is the truth, that I would have to hear my wife complain. And I didn't want to hear my wife complain that I had an hour and I had time to get there. So I left in my work clothes, and I went grumpy, tired, didn't want to be there. Brother Don Blackwell was the preacher at the time. And later when he heard my story, he told me the lesson he preached that night wasn't the one that he originally prepared, but something he had preached previously and just thought it was appropriate that night. And as he's preaching, he said, if you know that you should be doing something for God and you're not, it's a sin. I told Renetta when we got home, I called Don the next day, and I asked him what I needed to do, and Don said, you need to go to preaching school, brother. I told Renetta what I wanted to do, and she looked at me and said, are you serious? Because I had said that a few times in the past and not been serious. And she said, if we make this decision, we're going. We're not turning back. 100%, she said, We've got to, you've got to be on board. And she was on board, and I was too. It was in April of 2011 and in July 2011, I was in Elizabethton, Tennessee, getting ready to start classes in August. And I graduated in 2013. Let me say that what changed my life was the Word of God, the truth. I had so many questions because I studied. And fortunately, and thankful to God that He brought Renetta into my life. And though we fell in love... She did not put her faith 
aside. She made it a priority to serve God and to teach me. And so many in the church kept teaching me, and they continue to teach me. And for that, I'm very, very thankful. I've been redeemed redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Lamb. I've been redeemed redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. God's Word changed my life forever, and I would like to speak to those that are truly, truly seeking to do God's will. God's Word is clear in what we must do to be saved. He tells us in Romans that we must hear the Word of God. In Romans 10, 17, he says, we must hear the Word of God. He tells us in John 8, 24, that we must believe, but yet we will die in our sins. He tells us in Luke 13, 3, and Acts 2, 38 as well, that we looked at that we must repent. Leave those things that are keeping us away from God. And we must confess in Romans 10, 9 and 10, that Jesus is our Lord, that He died on that cross and He was raised from the dead. And we must put on Christ for us to become a Christian. We must hear, believe, repent, confess, but we must be baptized. That's how we're added to the church in Acts 2, 47. And in Galatians 3, 26, 27, we put on Christ by being baptized. And in Revelation 2, 10, we, they're told there, even if it causes death, remain faithful and you shall receive the crown of life. Let me urge you and encourage you that to reach out to someone that if you've got questions in the Lord's church and let them study with you. Every soul is precious. Every soul is precious. Would you like to know more about God, His Word, Jesus Christ, salvation, eternal life in heaven? We invite you to visit freebiblestudies.net and request a local free Bible study. We also encourage and invite you to visit the local Church of Christ in your community. Simply search the internet for Church of Christ or visit findthelordschurch.com for an interactive list of supporting congregations of the Gospel of Christ. Today's broadcast has been brought to you by individuals and members of the Church of Christ and produced by the Gospel of Christ and Gospel Broadcasting Network. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844-6-GOSPEL. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your smartphone.